Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Digital Futures Education Podcast. I'm here with Natalie Piero. Natalie is a Spanish translator specializing in education, an ESL teacher. Natalie is also a language access consultant. Thank you for joining us, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's good to have you back. So one thing I'd like to do is just go over the the ed tech in Argentina. You know, we kind of got Uh into this topic a little bit last week. And, you know, I just wanted to kind of show, you know, just we'll, we'll look at the top couple companies here. And maybe you can tell me if, you, if you've heard of some of these kind of, a lot of them are out of Buenos Aires themselves. You know, I don't know how they mm. determined why these were listed the top. I don't know if it's a market size or anything else, but these are all ed tech startups and companies in Argentina. <coughs> so, <coughs> so this is the School of Innovation, Escuela de Innovación. Well, that's in Cordoba. Uh-huh. Cordoba. The virtual school is that what it sounds See that, like? I think that, that one focuses on it's accessing uh, a job, it's okay. about learning skills, you know, mm-hmm. uh, more aimed at adults. adults. It's more like Coder House, okay, which is the biggest one, okay. And that's in Buenos Aires, Coder House, right? It's based out of Buenos Aires, Coder House, yes. Match Up Global, Global. What are they so doing? It's a- Line is that like all the universities in the world in just one, one place. So oh. I believe it aggregates data, right? Okay. Learning data. So maybe, uh, and also where you can like do a master's, for example. Okay. It's, it's great to have, if it, I can, uh, remotely, you can get them in, I don't know, Spain. Okay. From Argentina, we, I, could, I could get, so maybe that they, they put together information. That's what I think they do. Okay, and then we have searching for your class. This is uh, for oh, so for connecting to alumni yes. and with and professors. Yeah, expand the availability uh, of educational opportunities. Yeah, finding finding a teacher. Okay, very cool. Uh, and private then, tutor. Okay, private tutor. Yeah, finding the private tutor. All right, Nucky Learning. Technical analysis, cryptocurrency, how you learn about money. So is this financial literacy learning? Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Gnosis, Gnosis Kids? Interesting. As you can see, and they were founded in 2018, 2019. They are, they are young companies. I, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So founded in 2019, this one 2022. So they're young companies. Very, There's um, a lot of interest, I, I guess. And it would be interesting to see, like, we don't have to do this today, but see the investors and see if some of the investor groups are similar. Yeah. Digital classes and video games, simulate cognitive, cognitive learning for kids, neural learning. Interesting. Check this one. It says class.me. This a Netflix for oriented for ori- education. oriented twenty fourteen this one. So it is one wow. years old. It's been hanging in there. Hmm? No else communicate for simple school communication. Look, look at this one, number eight says this is aimed at kindergarten. It says tools of management and communication for kindergarten. So this is tools. 2017. They focus on communicating with uh, uh, families and very, very focused on niche, right? Making it easy, yeah. So maybe you can look for the, the ones that are more interesting and we could, uh, we could uh, ask them if uh, yeah. they, See if they, they want to, to talk about their... Yeah, their, definitely some options. I definitely want to speak to... I want to speak to a couple... Of, I want to get someone from Coder House. I think that'd be interesting. You know, just to kind of like a high one. level... Yeah, just to get a little high one. level overview from Coder House because uh, I think it would just be interesting to hear a little bit about their story, particularly from, especially from the Argentina perspective of ed tech as well as being one of the larger, uh, so that, you know, companies f- with that in that niche. A cl- ed tech marketplace for loans. That's interesting. Loans. Yeah. So. Creating community with the parents of a school to buy their lists easily. 
our mission is to get all kids to go with all the nest. Oh, we are collaborate. That's kind of want to go and profit. Yeah. Okay. Right. Interesting. Raise from Institute of the Future of Education, and then proffer instant online tutoring, learning more virtual campus mm -hmm. for multiple education. Interbrain and tech innovating corporate training via immersive tech. Uh, Otelia O, Olivia O. Wow, there's so many. <laughs> yeah, this was educated. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of like get into this. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't stopped around twenty, but yeah, there's a lot. So this was all, you know, La Buenos Aires. It's just it's a rich little environment of ed tech companies growing. And startups. So, yeah, we, yeah, between here and LinkedIn, we, we can to talk to someone to, to speak and connect yeah. and, and go from there. But I wanted to kind of show that list. I, I thought that was a pretty good. I just felt like it was Amazing. not company. Yeah, companies that you definitely would think of off the top of your, your head. And no. just no, a lot no. of different markets there, too. So, let's interesting. get. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Let me get back to the. Doc, do you, do you, as a person, you live in Buenos Aires, do you recognize the, like, influence of ed tech companies at all and any, anything like, like, do you hear about them? Do you, like, it just, you know, like, in Boston, like, we have a couple companies, Gearson is, has a big office here. We have a couple, like, incubator places for ed tech companies in Boston to help get started with it, you know, and we have, of course, like places like MIT Innovation Lab and places like, is there, do you hear of young people looking for opportunities to work in ed tech at all? Like, are you aware, like, was it something that you were kind of aware of before we kind of speak to, spoke about it at all or? I, I, I honestly, I didn't know there were so, well, pretty far, there's not a, a lot, but there are quite a few. I, did, I just didn't know so many companies or startups were in ed tech. Yeah, I'm noticing. So I'm yeah. quite impressed. I came across it only because I was starting to look at different, you know, LinkedIn really helped me notice a lot of it, just the amount of roles related to ed tech and just how it was kind of, you know, getting started and what types of products. And ed tech's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yes. I do. What, I, what what we can do is I'll do, let me talk a little bit about the process of becoming a teacher in the United States. I'll just do like a little synopsis here. This was something that we had on the, it, let me, I don't know if they'll be necessarily, I want to show, I'll show the state. I, you know, I'll just do a little discussion about it. You know, one thing, one thing me and Natalie had kind of talked about is just, you know, educator differences in education between you know, South America, Argentina, and the United States. And uh, we were talking briefly about, you know, just the differences in qualifications and processes. And, you know, so I started to share a little bit about licensing and discussion around um, what it takes to become an educator in the United States. And I will share one document. Let me go to this J1, this, the J1 visa.state.gov site. So this is now this is a this is a website essentially from it's not really an organization as much as it is um, the discussion around programs that support educators from other countries teaching in the United States. So this is how to become a sponsor. So if, if a company you know or an organization wanted to be a sponsor for educators to come to the United States and how to develop a program. So I'm going to kind of take it, take it back a level and, you know, move more That's for, yeah. So this was a little bit of research I was doing. Um, this is more for, let me get us back to more for the educator level. So this is for host families. I'm just looking to get us to the right level. Visa basics. So J1 and J2 visa is for the, the J visa isn't for, for students. 
if I'm not uh, wrong. For teachers, for teachers, I believe the J one. For teachers, it's a work J1 study. For teachers. Yep. Uh, work study. Let's right. let's do. So, yep. It, yep. So this is actually the doc that I found last night. So this is actually a good page here. So the J one, and this will talk a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about the visa. It will mention the visa requirements here. So. I, I, I've gone to programs. We're at this bridge, j1visa.state.gov site. Now, this is the kind of process for a teacher, essentially through a sponsorship program, which is right. what, what you need. So in terms of, and, and this website does have all the different types of roles, a pair, camp counselor, college student, government visitor, intern, international visitor. I'll do specifically teacher because, you know, we're focusing on, on education. I'm sure some of the teacher requirements are probably also similar to college university student, as well as professor, as well as short-term scholar and also international visitor. So yeah. as a participant for a teacher, you know, meet the qualifications for teaching in primary or secondary schools in their country or nationality or legal residence. So I'm going to guess that's pretty broad in terms of it's not asking for if you don't need a certification in your country, I'm guessing it won't matter here. You know, it's probably just more time on teaching. Um, that's why it's so work, broad because the, yeah, that's why it's so broad because it's different. Argentina. I, I did look into this to, to give you exact uh, information. So you you, be, you can become a kindergarten teacher, primary school teacher, secondary school, and then higher education. And you would need four years in each program. Uh, so I don't know, a primary teacher, primary school teacher, mm -hmm. it's a four-year program. For higher education, that's a five-year program. And that gives you the degree of, so there's no license or certificate. You, you just have a degree yes. uh, and you go to like teachers you're trained already so and that allows you to practice uh, to, to to teach in the whole country you don't you, you you don't need specific in cordoba or buenos aires or Chubut, so you don't specific license and i believe that in the us you need to be yes, licensed much, right? much different yeah much different and uh, i can go over that in just a minute that because it does connect to, to like, if you're interested in continuing to teach in the US, even if you're starting in a program like this, will be working, you know, so their next little teacher requirement is that you're teaching recently within 12 months, completed an advanced degree, have two years of full-time teaching within the past eight years. So this is where it gets a little deeper, be working as a teacher in the home country or country of legal residence, have recently within 12 months of the application completed an advanced degree. So if you read this and then you read the next line, it's a little misleading. Because if you ask me what an advanced degree is in the United States, an advanced degree is a master's oh, degree, not a bachelor's. Yeah. But in the next line, it says have a degree equivalent to a U.S. bachelor's degree in either education or the academic subject field in which they tend to teach. So after reading the first one, understand, I understand it better with this note. You need to have a bachelor's degree. Now, this is where licensing in the United States becomes, if you're thinking about you know, maybe staying in the United States or trying to extend this opportunity, however, you'll find that in the United States, you know, because we have this licensing system, the licensing, licensing system essentially allows you to have a degree other than an education degree. So that's why they do say in education or in a su academic subject field that they want to teach in. So yeah, what that's a, right. so, so you could get, you could get a bachelor's in education, but you also could have a bachelor's of science degree. So you could have a, yeah. a bat, you know, which would be different, or maybe you studied mathematics specifically. For myself, I have an art degree that allowed, you know, I didn't have an education degree initially. 
but I was able to get into education through acquiring a master's in education, which I can kind of talk about a little bit differently, but have a minimum. Yeah, in Argentina. Yeah. Yeah, in Argentina, you, you can, there's actually, it's called, it's like you get a, it's not a license, but you get, you, you just, uh, you just uh, do the, the course, you, you like, you, you do a course on pedagogical training. So okay. if you have a degree, for example, you can become a law teacher by doing that one year course. So that, that gives you the, the love of a teacher, right? So mm-hmm. maybe that's something similar similarity but it's not it's not a license it's just another degree right it's kind of a degree and there's pros and there's pros and cons to that system for both countries too the degree being the only pathway to it being a teacher and then the the licensing has another layer of kind of complications too which i can kind of get into it but there's challenges to both systems so they want two years as a teacher satisfy the standards mm-hmm. of the U.S. state in which they will teach. And I can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> I know that inside and out, kind of. Be of a um, good reputation and character. Of course you would have a good reputation and character. Of course. Be seeking <laughs> to enter the United States for the purpose of full-time teaching as a teacher of record at a primary, including pre-K or secondary accredited institution. Now... I don't know if this would work for one of our charter schools as well, or private schools, you, which you might want to look into if you were interested in that kind of route. And then there's a possession of English proficiency. And then the, the teacher, this, this is specifically around the design of a teacher coming for educational and providing cultural enrichment. Okay. So, What I've noticed is this program is specifically designed with all the visa questions. I've noticed it's around that educational and cultural enrichment. So the teacher is coming here to share what they know, and we're benefiting from the the teacher who's coming as well. Um, And they're gaining the experience. Teachers are eligible to repeat the program. (sighs) Teachers are eligible to repeat the program provided that they have reached resided outside the United States for two years to continue to meet the requirements. So what I would say to this is that let's compare this to college and university student just quickly, because you might be a young teacher, you know, you might be a young college, you might not have graduated college, but be interested in teaching, right? So a college shouldn't be financed directly or indirectly by the U.S. government of their home country or be financed directly or indirectly by the U.S. government of their home country, an international organization, a member of a treaty or statute, funding from other. So basically, whoever's supporting you needs to be financially liable for you. Right. Be no, here. Yep. Yep. Basically, that allows you to study, not to work. Basically, yep. uh, be carried out. I don't know the visa on this one. Uh, student internship program. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Agreement, written agreement. Pursue a non-degree program must pursue a non-degree program must be enrolled full time in a prescribed course of study. The maximum duration is twenty four months. So the benefits are the school credit, employment, academic training. Opportunity, so this has been the expansion, is the opportunity and training extension into STEM fields. So they actually have a separate program also for the STEM fields. So now let's get, we'll get to the nitty gritty a little bit. Uh, back to the teacher. Where's teacher, teacher, teacher? Did I skip teacher? Back to teacher. All right. So now... What they require you to do is find a sponsor. So you right. find a sponsor. So this is where I got into it because I'm thinking about having digital future education become potentially a sponsor. So that's where I would essentially pay a fee, have this organization be able to provide the language assessment, the support and kind of the information and training to support people who wanted to teach in the United States to fill specific gaps that we might have here 
and basically do the checks and balances. So this is what sponsors do. Screen and select qualified foreign teachers based on qualifications who can make a contribution to the United States and want to learn teaching methods. Verify each teacher's application in the applicant's English language proficiency through a language test or interviews, which is interesting that they have the option of an interview. Monitor the exchange teachers stay in the United States to ensure that they are satisfactorily performing their teaching responsibilities. Ensure each ed exchange teacher completes a cultural activity component, which includes two requirements. Activity at their school, supporting the district population or community at large, basically participating. An activity that involves U.S. student dialogue with schools or students in another country, prefer preferably the teacher's home country, which is kind of cool. Basically, they, you mm -hmm. know, when they're here, they then reach back to their own country and say either they like it or they don't <laughs> at that point, probably. Um, <laughs> Teachers must provide participants with the following. The duration and location of the participants program, a summary of the significant components of the program. So basically, you know, how much of the cost of the program, a written statement of the teaching requirements and related professional obligations, and a written statement that clearly indicates the compensation package to be provided to the exchange visitor teacher and any other financial arrangements relative to the program. And there also are host employers. So the sponsor would work with hosts and also the employer. Involve exchange teacher with in school and community cultural activities, monitor the performance of exchange teachers in the classroom. The base period for a teacher exchange is three years. However, host schools may apply to the sponsor for a one or two year extension, which is interesting that they could go as mm -hmm. one or five. Requests are not automatic, but there is no limit on the number of extensions that the State Department can grant. Really? Huh? Interesting. Uh, I thought there was a, a limit. Maybe there is. I mean... So it's indefinite? According to the State Department. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would imagine you have to keep applying and then... Keep applying. Uh, the, the difference yeah. with other visas, this one does not, from what I'm, from what you're reading, does not allow you to one day apply for a green card or some shape or anything this is what i understand um, this is not lead citizenship thing no or green card no or no, no. I, I uh, so it's like an exchange cultural change it's an exchange program. but it uh, yeah i mean the but i do think you could probably to be honest with you, like if you say you were here for two years on this, if you applied for a different type of visa, potentially, I could see your likelihood being greatly increased of getting that other visa. Right. Yeah. Like, I know that's not like right. the greatest news for someone who wants to. But if you want citizenship, like, I do think that. Like the change of status, that, as they call it. It's a yeah. change of immigration status. So you are yes. on a J1, J2, well, you are... There's another one. It's the EB something, EB1, EB2. And it's a visa of, like, it's natural interest for the United States. So you need to prove the United States that you are of national interest. So that applies to professors, okay. teachers too. So maybe if you are really good and you have, I mean, some recognition in your country, you could apply... This is not a very very well known, but maybe for a, for a position in university, for example, or for research. So, and this this one is limited, so you can definitely apply. This is a an automatic green card. I mean, it makes you a resident, right? But you need to prove you are of national interest to the country, right? So you have a degree, yeah, bachelor, degree, yeah. a master's degree, and then you have some experience or experience, and well. And there is a need for, for your knowledge in the United States. And that, that can also apply to teachers or professors more. Let's so, go. yeah. I don't know if you were aware of that one, but it, that is not... No. Uh, I'm going to do a quick... Uh, but, yeah, there's this one does not require a sponsor, but you need to figure out if, if you are of national interest. So the so H1B? Yeah. EB. 
So this like is what I N just... Like N-I, national, like that is a word visa. This one is an N-I-W, is national interest waiver. Let me see if because it's that is on a this. Word visa. The one that I mentioned is not a word visa. Let me see if they list it here. Because this is, so this is I remote I-9. The H-1B the I -9 work. I this is allows a school to sponsor a foreign national. Right. That is a okay. sponsorship visa. That's a sponsorship. J-1, which we were just which talking about. Yeah. Three years. Okay. And then which, what's the one you were just, you named it the... EB, I think it's EB1, EB2. EB5? Like N... IW, National Interest Visa, a waiver, National Interest Waiver. That's how it's okay. EB2. EB2. Or something. EB2. Yeah. So this is commonalities between the EB1 and EB2. Are both typically prepared by, by a business immigration team. The EB-1 stands for Employment-Based First Preference Visa. Oh, I need to share this, sorry. So the EB-1 stands for Employment-Based yeah. First Preference Visa. As the first preference visa for business immigration, the EB-1 tends to be the most expedited path to a green card. EB-1s also waive the lengthy PERM labor certification. Yeah, um, it's much, down, it's, much it's not okay. easy to qualify for though it says you do need some like it's an extraordinary ability here like yeah you need to just prove that you have an ability not nothing crazy yeah. but you have an ability it's an employment skill. employment based immigrant immigrant visa mm -hmm. so you, there's a perm labor certification process that'd be worth us looking into yeah. uh, and then the eb1 and the, there you go researchers yeah. academic professors so let me, I'll make this a little bit bigger if I can. So with this one, EB-1B for outstanding researchers, academics, and professors. The EB-1B is reserved for outstanding researchers, academics, and professors, often pursued by academics that came to the U.S. as international students, but many other foreign nationals qualify qualifies for 15 day premium processing, are subject to a totality test, sustained national or international claim. Foreign nationals can qualify for the EB-1B by submitting evidence for at least two criteria. Evidence of receipt of major prizes or awards, evidence of membership and mm -hmm. association, that's not hard to do. Evidence of published material and professional, so Publish. It's not always too bad. Evidence of participation either on a panel or individually as a judge of the work of others in the same or allied field. Evidence of original scientific or scholarly research contributions. Evidence of authorship of scholarly books or articles. So they give the example of a data scientist who recently finished her master's degree. Now she's working for a U.S. company on OPT but needs more permanent immigration solution um, serves as a judge now does this one require that you've worked in the united states though that's the only thing i see kind of hinted at this like i see no, here I don't think so, but... because they say here like even in their example working for a u.s company i don't know if that's remotely or what now none of this says this but they kind of say that came to the u.s as an international student it but says it's say, often pursued by academics. Yeah. But I'm it's just, not a requirement. I just hinted at it a couple places that made it kind of like uh, maybe. But no, this is good to know. So and then I'm there's sure the EB2 because there, there must be some difference with the EB2. This is based on work, and I believe EB2 is not. Well, I don't know. Let's see. EB. So the EB2 stands for Employment Based Second Preference. Um, advanced degrees are exceptional ability in their fields. You're an exceptional translator, Natalia. I would love to one day be granted a visa 
and uh, work there. I don't know if I'm exceptional or anything, but uh, it's a state of mind. This is something I could pursue <laughs> if I wanted to work there one day. I would love to one day be granted a visa and uh, work there. I don't know if I'm exceptional or anything, but uh, it's a state of mind. This is something I could pursue <laughs> if I wanted to work there one day. And let's see how they define um, exceptional ability. So this exceptional mm -hmm. ability is defined by in six criteria. A related degree, diploma, or certificate. That's not horribly I, difficult. I, Ten years of related full-time no, experience. A license or certification to practice relevant profession. Interesting. A salary above the 70th percentile. Membership oh, in a professional right. association. I am a member. Strong letters of reference from peers. You see, it's, it's in general, it tends to be easier for immigrants to qualify for EB2 compared to EB1 because I don't see, I mean, not everyone yeah. has all of those requirements, meets all of those requirements, but it's not awfully difficult. No. At least I, I think I meet most of the requirements. Yeah, that's not that uh, bad. Not, not a published author or anything, right? That's not the other bad one at requires, all. But you do need to prove, from what I've learned, to prove that the, the United States would benefit from you being there. Um, right. There's something that you can provide and you can, uh, I mean, there's national interest in whatever you can do. Here's so natural, if you can, if you can prove you, can, you are of national interest, any kind of profession, and also if you have a teaching degree, you can, you can definitely get a, 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 like a visa. Substantial merit, well positioned. Benefit of the United States to waive. To like the waiver is because they waive the the need to to, to be sponsored or to already yeah, have a and job. Also the need and that perm labor certification. Right. So you wouldn't need um, that because because of the national interest or whatever. That is the actual process for permanent labor. Certification yeah. depend. So, so you would not need that certification, and that would speed up the process. And, yeah, um, that process in time. Even yeah. for people in edtech, talking about mm -hmm. edtech. So, people in edtech here in Argentina or anywhere in the world or Latin America, if if they can, I mean, they have knowledge and they have come up with something, they they could apply for this one. Yeah. Right, so maybe yeah. they have uh, something that that is of yeah. national interest. You, you just, just have need to, to yeah. find. You have to find it and document ed. it. And there's lots of speaking opportunities. Yeah, speaking Documenting opportunities, licenses, certifications, trainings, and doing it in areas of definitely categories that the United States needs more people uh -huh. who do it. That would be the first research. Like, what does the U.S. need right now? Yeah. So where, where's the... Data science. Data, data science is huge. I would say, data. you know, if you ask me off the top of my head what we need is, you know, definitely keep an eye on education needs. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, we definitely have different needs related to education or, you know, I'll pop that back, but... We definitely have needs related to education. I would say data science, cybersecurity, mm -hmm. uh, AI, AI, and who is a yeah. And and AI is definitely also a a field which would probably be very easy to do something to stand out very quickly. You know, yeah. you know, like it's an evolving field that has a lot of impact in a lot of different places. So like mm -hmm. anything that you're doing related to AI could be easily explored as a, a place of great value because you we don't already have, it hasn't gotten so specific that like, if you were to say, I want to become a consultant for translators with the use of AI. Right. How many, not many established positions like that. So if you could document and establish yourself like that, you're, you, you know, mm -hmm. Or cybersecurity, you know, how do you, what is, what is the effective communication for people across languages to best understand cybersecurity practices? And how do we train and 
promote yeah. effective use using a wide range of languages. Speak briefly on teacher licensing yeah. in the United States. So say you want to become a teacher, you come here under any one of these visas or any one of these kind of opportunities, even if you are a citizen here and you've um, did a bachelor's degree. For the most part, the way it works is this, like either you've done a, a bachelor's degree in education or a subject area. If you've done a bachelor's degree in education, a majority of programs are going to have a licensure component within your bachelor's degree kind of at the end with a little practicum where they actually put you into a school and have you do some observed lessons, where they're basically doing a little teacher training around pedagogy and observation, classroom time to get you, basically get you to the point where when you're graduating, you're also taking your first teacher test. So if you're an education major, um, graduate in the United States, you're probably taking a teacher test in your last like year of school. At some point, you're getting your you're taking a teacher test. If you are a science person or your bachelor of science and you want to become a teacher, you still you would need to take a test and your bachelor's degree needs to be in a subject area, which is a relatable like content area. So like you could get a bachelor's of English degree and teach English. You, um, you can get a bachelor's of science degree and probably teach a subject area in science. Um, you could probably get a bachelor's in business and teach business, but we don't really have a business, at least in Massachusetts, we don't have a business teaching license. We do, but it kind of falls under some other areas. <clears throat> so some of these things I can speak to specifically in Massachusetts, for instance, and then some of these things are national. So across the country, every state essentially has a license in their state, a certification or license once the teachers finish their bachelor's degree. There's two main, two or three main types of teaching tests. One of them is called the Praxis, which is a teaching test for subject areas. And then we have in Massachusetts called an MTEL. And states develop their own teacher tests. And a majority of these teacher tests are half the test is kind of content area related to the topic. The other half of the test is usually a writing or a kind of communication skill-based test. So the, the writing and communication skill-based test is usually a series of essays and generic questions to basically be sure that if you're going to the teaching profession that you're able to effectively communicate and write effectively and formate essays and answer basic questions. And then you have a subject area test. You need, to comp you need to get a passing score on both tests, the subject area test and then also your communications test. So basically one test is essentially making sure that you can write and read proficiently and one is making sure that you know your subject area for the grade level that you're teaching at. There are several other opportunities to teach. Uh, there are still some states that have probably have emergency licenses available from COVID, from shortages that were out there. And, and emergency licenses can be accessed by having a bachelor's degree and then even have a tried to or signed up for a test. Like they'll, they'll kind of look at you for taking that next step. Um, but you basically, after you completed your bachelor's degree, or even while in the last year or so, you can, you can if you pass the subject area test and the other half test, which basically tells you if you're able to write effectively, you get your license. And so a bachelor's degree and the passing of the test mm -hmm. essentially gives you a teacher's license for two to three, basically for two to three years usually. During the two to three years, most states then... Uh, okay. I'm sorry. You okay? Basically... Uh, I have two questions. So sure. you need you need to retake this? You need to redo it? Uh, three years? No. Okay. Second so, question. What about the pedagogic? What about pedagogy? Do you... Like with teaching. Do you test them on that? Yep. So... So once oh, you get okay. your like once you get your license, you know, so the teachers who come out of the education systems usually the ones who do like an education degree are generally fine with the licensing piece. 
the ones who like for myself, like I taught art, I didn't necessarily do a lot of art education classes in my bachelor's. I, you know, basically once you get your license and you start teaching, a clock starts to tick of about two to three years in which you need to complete a master's degree in education. So that master's degree in education then essentially makes it so that you need to get some of that, that pedagogy piece in. That's the differentiated oh. instruction, that's writing lessons. So it is possible to get into education. And this is, you know, a lot of states actually designed it this way so they can get people into education without necessarily having some of the background experiences that teachers sometimes need to write lessons and teach. And then you're actually required within that, like, I think three, you know, basically two to five year period of the initial teaching to then get the master's degree in education. And then that kind of ensures that you have kind of done that kind of background teaching work with the pedagogical work, the classroom, you know, lesson design, um, your themes and education. And then once you get that degree, you then have to, you can then, whatever your subject area is, you then have to pay to extend the license. So there isn't, you know, you do have a certain number of what's called professional development points, which is basically um, professional development, self-directed training, courses maybe offered yeah. within your school that all, but those are actually very easy to accumulate. And those all support you towards your next application for, for the license. So you don't necessarily have to do more courses, uh. but you can do these other types of hourly based work that kind of get you to the next step. Now, many districts, when we talk about teacher pay, actually have a, have a pay scale for how many credits past your master's. So you get your bachelor's, you get your master's, you actually get a pay bump when you get your master's, and then you actually will get pay bumps incrementally up to a certain number of graduate credits past your master's degree. So you don't, so not only do you get the pay bump for your grad master's, you also get, if you take additional graduate credit, you'll get additional pay. So that also increases your salary a lot, actually quite a bit. So districts are in the process of like limiting that over time, but there's still pretty good bumps. Things to encourage you to basically take four to five to six classes past um, your master's degree to keep going up the pay scale. So it actually can be quite kind of good money over time. And that money you keep getting in your contract too. So like, it's not like you just get it for that one where if you stay working for that district and you got, you did your master's, you did other classes, you keep getting um, money. That's kind of, and then what happens is your license is kind of scale. You have your first license, a preliminary license, then you have like a second level license that's good for three to five years. And then eventually you move into what's a professional license. And that professional license just needs to be kind of renewed and subject area. You know, you continue to get credits towards um, an inner professional development work in that license area. And it kind of keeps moving forward that. But that's the... Basics in a nutshell of most licensing systems, um, you have a bachelor's degree, you then take a subject area test or, you know, in another type of state, you know, kind of focus test. So what you want to do is wherever you plan on working, you just want to research what tests are available to get that entry level license in the content area that you think you're going to teach in. That usually gets you a couple years into teaching, but then for most states, you be asked to do another degree that supports that next professional level license which can kind of drive some people crazy if they already have a master's degree in another area because they're why do i have to do another master's degree but it's kind of tough to avoid but it does but they don't necessarily have the degree work to show that they would be a good teacher either so it kind of also shows the value of education in terms of the the pedagogy but those programs are also not very expensive either And if you're lower on the pay scale, it will pay you back. You'll get that money back in your contract oh. over years. Like when I got finished with my master's, I basically got the entire cost of the master's program back in my contract that year. 
and in continually for every year after I worked. So it was definitely a good investment. Now, what I'm hoping happens is that, you know, say I would say I would get into this kind of sponsorship situation. What I would try to do is find needs in districts that needed teachers, find people who are interested in teaching, who had a bachelor's degree, who were able to get a license. Mm -hmm. And basically I would like to try to find a way to, as they're starting these programs, license them within their state and give them the professional development and the training to help them get the license so that they, they could even look for further opportunities in professional growth because it's not that difficult to, if you have a bachelor's degree specifically, to get that first opportunity and then turn that into extended teaching, kind of go forward. And maybe do the master's already, maybe do the master's in the U.S., maybe get a master's. Yeah. I, I mean, you could, you could, you could easily, you could easily, if you knew you were going to be here for two years, some of those programs even say, like, it's a minimum of two-year commitment anyway, I think. Start the master's right when you got here. And right. actually, you're, I mean, as long right. as, it, you know, you, you should be able to pay for it and you could probably do it. Most of the master's programs are like 18 months, you know, in the United States, the master's of ed. And you can do some of them online. You know, you don't even have to go to the campuses right. sometimes. Could in, But there's also no danger in not rushing. I would say it's almost more important to just work. I would say it's, if you were to come here and teach in a subject area without a license, Here's what the challenge is. There's going to be districts that won't want to hire people without a license. So if you're going mm -hmm. to a place where someone's hiring you without a license, that's going to immediately be something that they're going to want to help you fix. So your first priority area is probably get the license in the state and where you're working. And at the same time, then kind of start the masters. You, but you can do both at the same time. Um, and they have alternative yeah. forms of license. That's nice. Yeah, you can. It's not that hard. You just want to. It's like it's just like getting a visa or something else. It's like about knowing the processes in which the state wants you to kind of go through. But it's definitely doable. Yeah, um, and, and having I, someone to guide you. Yeah, this licensing. Yeah, exactly. you can make it sound easy, but it's it, it it's it's a lot to know. Only reason I make it sound easy is because I went through I went through hell with it on my own, like. Like my, right. not hell, but right. I went, I dropped out of college the first time. So I went to college for like three years. I dropped out. I went back. When I went back, I was like, I want to be a teacher. I finished. I had an right. art license. Okay. I had an art degree, no license. I wanted to teach art. I went to go teach art. I went and took the tests. I passed the tests. Now I had the license and I had the degree because it was a content area, it wasn't an education degree. I started working little part-time jobs, but I wasn't getting kind of hired by anyone to teach in a regular kind of setting full-time. I was getting a lot of part-time jobs. Because getting an art teaching job is actually kind of hard in the United States. It's like you kind of, there's so many people who kind of want to do it. It's the opportunities aren't all over the place, you know, and people have to like you. There's a little bit of politics involved. And so eventually I got a job. But I got it in special education, teaching art. And after a year, huh. after a year of teaching the art job, they were like, "You're in special education. You need to get a special education license," which is actually really <laughs> difficult. So I just got my art one, and they were like, "That's okay for now." So I went and I took all the special education tests, and they were hard. And I, I, I took them, and I actually I bombed one of them. And I didn't pass it. And I was like, oh, but I learned that what I needed to take, you know, and they actually have more special education actually has one or two different tests that allow you to teach the foundations and fundamentals of reading, which is more challenging. Mm -hmm. Can definitely outside of my wheelhouse as an art person was teaching phonetics. So I, you know, I studied as much as I could, but I couldn't, I had trouble passing it. I came within a couple of points the first time and did worse the second time. So I was like, I'm done. So, but I was lucky I got hired to then teach within a regular art program. I taught within the regular art program for a year. After that year, I 
had my license, but then people were starting to say, you need to get your master's in education. All right. So I decided to do my master's in education. Foolish me. I, so what I didn't really know was that when you pick a master's, you really should pick a master's that actually, especially if you don't have a teaching license in an, an area, you definitely want to do a master's that um, ends in licensure. They actually have master's programs that like the end of the program is like you get your master's and you also get a license. I did a master's without a license. So I did a master's without a license, but it was in education. Thank God. So I did that. So while I was doing that, I was teaching under my first little license in art. I decided, hey, I want to teach. I got the opportunity to teach technology. Thankfully, when I started teaching technology, it was kind of like in a combined program that also was with the art department because they were doing computer animation. So my license was okay, but then they said to me, my boss says to me, well, you need to get the technology license. So I need, yeah. So I had to do, I had to do a high school art license and renew that. And then I also needed to get the technology license. Well, I had to do the art license first. So I did an alternative program to do the art license. I taught under the art license for three years. I then decided I wanted to be more involved with technology and I became an instructional technology specialist. At the same time, I, after, my, after my master's, I kind of started doing my doctorate within a year or two after. When I needed the ITS license, that instructional technology license, I didn't want to take another test. And so they said that you can actually use coursework or other programs to kind of endorse you for teaching the technology. And I had been working with technology for like five or six years at that point. So I actually had all the endorsement letters from classes I had taken with professors and I put all these endorsement letters together and put those as evidence towards the work with the technology and they gave me the license. So I had that license. I then worked under that job for one year. While doing that one, I also did an endorsement license to be a director under my previous boss. So I did like a mentorship with my director to get my director's license. So I got my director's license, ITS license. Well, then our state added a computer science license for teachers. So, but they did not have a test for this license. So the way to get this license was to actually do a program with your supervisor in which you um, went over the skills and competencies of that license in like a cohort group. So I put together the cohort group for five teachers around computer science and we did it like virtually over about a three or four month period. And, and so I got those teachers license and a license I didn't even have. So my boss was like, you should get, <laughs> you should be able to get the license from, and I'm like, you know what, you're right. So I, I actually applied for the license to get it when I did the cohort for them. So, which was beneficial because I got the license. So what I've learned was like, you know, like there's just a lot of different routes to licensure and a lot of it just comes down to understanding the content area and then either taking the test and passing the test. But if you don't, there's a lot of other ways to satisfy the requirement through other types of training and professional development. So like you just have to kind of like figure out yeah. what that is. And I know I went on that little tangent for a while, but that's how I learned a little bit about it. And then I was on a licensing board and try to support some different licenses in my state. And it's not that hard. It's just, it's one of those things that's annoying because every couple of years you end up having to deal with it or just think about it in your own career. So you end up having to kind of update what you have to do and there's regulations around yeah. it. And so, right. But you, yeah, you can do anything you want. Thank you so much. I've used up all your time again. I feel horrible. Hopefully this, your the journey, the, uh, how you got, to where you are, it's quite interesting to know. Well, it's time to help people. It's time to help people and give back as much as I can. So, no, thank you for all your help today with uh, letting me understand the Connectar Igualdad too. I appreciate that a lot. That was uh, great to talk to. Is, is there an AI tool you're currently using for anything? Just curious. 
AI tools. Not really crazy about AI tools. I don't, they are, and if, if I'm in, they are they overwhelming. I need to, I need someone to tell me because there are so many that that one, there are so many that it's overwhelming. I, I use in, I mean, we, we can't, there are tools in for translation. Now we use, well, ChatGPT. Yeah. And then for content, for idea, that I use not all the time, but I have used uh, for my teaching and for my translating jobs. Yeah. But I'm not, I'm not an expert as you are. <laughs> no, I'm not an expert either. I've just been in doing tech. some deep dives and I'm intrigued by the tech. So thank you again for your time. I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm not going to steal any more of it from you. Uh, thank you for your insights on everything. Uh, we dug into a lot, so I appreciate it all. And hopefully Thank you're up. Hopefully you're up for nice some time you. next week too. So we'll hopefully have you back. Yeah, no problem. We can we can check uh, this some as is to discuss. Like, like I'll be reading yeah. this week and see if I there's something. Uh, for instance, when, when you talk about special education, I'm very much into special education and disability. So technology can help access. It's an accessibility tool in some ways, so uh, that, that would be interesting to get into. Also, so how like, we could talk about I, the I don't know. There yeah. Must be AI uh, oh. uh, help in 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 the sense of accessibility and uh, and special education needs, right? To I mean, so maybe it's a good topic. I'm gonna actually take a note on that one. Ac accessibility um, for special education and AI. And also the set framework. We can talk maybe maybe about the set framework. That's the framework, the most common framework for identifying the appropriate tool for special education students. Basically, the set framework is a process of identifying technology tools, special education mm -hmm. students. And maybe we can kind of do an AI yeah. spin on that, which might be interesting. Yeah, or at least encourage if there's nothing out there, maybe encourage people to maybe like it's smart people to find solution challenges that some have. Uh, so, exactly. Um, I know that there are a lot of ways to improve accessibility when it comes to you know a list a hearing impairment or a visual impairment or an intellectual disability. So I believe technology can help. Uh, in those cases too, right? No, totally. An accessibility. I know inclusion. it's later for you. You're inclusion. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Inclusion. That's right. <laughs> we talked a little bit about that. Right. I feel bad for how much time I've taken, so I have to let you go. Yeah. You well, the, the Conectar Igualdad. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Dan. Hey. No, thank, thank, thank you for all the time today, Natalia. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure always. Interesting talk, always. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. See you.